All right, all right, gamers. I am actually excited to make this video because some brand new Fallout TV show news just dropped today. Like a whole bunch of news, like a whole big info dump with lots of pictures. So I'm excited to get into this after the intro. So you know what you gotta do, like and subscribe. And this article exclusive is coming from Vanity Fair. I'm sure it's been shared a bunch of times already. I, I found this article when I was at work, so I couldn't make a video until I got home. But I couldn't wait to make the video, I was so excited. And first it all opens up with a great first picture already of Ella Purnell. You can tell this is like a shot of her just leaving the vault and seeing the world for the first time. And there's there's the vault door in the background, but I feel like I, sh I want to get into the picture separately and just focus on the article for now. It's a pretty long article too. I went through it already. Fallout often looks like the distant past, but it's really the far future. And actually, it's the end of life as we know it. In the new series debuting on Amazon Prime Video on April 12th, a nuclear war breaks out across earth in the year 2077 what is with what is with that year 2077 that's the same year that cyberpunk takes place in which is or was an era of robots hover cars and a deep and abiding nostalgia for the america of the 1940s everyone from the clothes entertainment vehicles mimic the look of that bygone age i'll buy it i'll be it with a sci-fi tilt the retro futuristic aesthetic was one of the charms of the mega selling video game that inspired the show here you have another really great picture of ella and Kyle McClanahan who plays her dad and I think he's like also kind of the boss of that vault they they're they staying in. Mass Extension is just the starting point for Fallout which was developed for TV by Westwood creators and husband and wife Nola, Jonathan, Jonathan Nolan and Lisa Joy. After the incendiary mushroom clouds the story flashes forward 219 years. How did humanity fare over those blighted two centuries? Lucy, one of the lead characters played by Yellow Jacket star Ella Purnell. Yellow Jacket is a great show, check it out. It has no clue. She was, she has lived her entire life inside a subterranean vault where every need and want has been satisfied well, satisfied while well, generations and generations await the day when it is safe to serve. When a crisis forces Lucy to venture above on a rescue mission, she finds that the planet above remains a hellscape crawling with giant insects, voracious mutant animal abominations, and a human population of sunbaked miscreants who make the manners, morals, and hygiene of the gunslinging Old West look like Downtown Abbey. The games are about the culture and division and haves and have-nots, unfortunately have only gotten more and more acute in this country and around the world over the last decades, Nolan tells Vanity Fair. Lucy is nice, but Lucy is naive. In the Fallout universe, the human beings fortunate enough to ride out the apocalypse in underground communities only had that option available to them because they had money. Forcing doe-eyed Lucy out into the sadistic Darwinian remnant of civiliza civilization opens the door for Fallout to engage in some social satire, as well as action and adventure. Like HBO's hit The Last of Us, which was adapted from a blockbuster game, The End of the World offers a rich opportunity to comment for the real one. This is Jonathan and Lisa, Lisa Joy, but they're actually talking about Westworld, so nothing to do with that show. We get to talk about that in a wonderful speculative fiction way, says Nolan, who directed the first three episodes. I think we're all looking at the world and going, God, this thing seemed to be seem things seem to be set heat God, things seem to be heading in a very, very frightening direction. So many of us have such naive ideas, even now, about everyone's else experiences. And it's one of the things I love about America. It's this gigantic manic collection of different experiences, different points of views. Desperation only exacerbates these fissures and fallout as Pernell's do-gooder soon discovers Lucy is charming and plucky and strong and when and then you see her, she's confronted with the reality of hey maybe the supposedly virtuous things you grew up with are not necessarily that virtuous if they are virtuous they're couched in a circumstantial virtuousness it's a luxury virtue you have your point of view because you never ran out of food, right? You guys were able to share everything because you had enough to share. The Fallout series tracks her collision with the hard reality of other people's experiences and what happened to the people who frankly were left behind to die. Fallout is leavened by the same twisted sense of humor that made the video game so appealing. The ubiquitous logo of Lucy's people, the Vault Dwellers, is a winking cartoon who perpetually flashes a giant smile and thumbs up sign. 
This Vault Boy iconography originates originated in the game and is an intended as an ironic tone deaf contrast to the hard scrabble existence of those who endure on the surface. Nolan and Joy's determination to maintain that mordant comedy was the key to making the world work as a series, says game maker Todd Howard. The director of 2008 Fallout 3 and 2015's Fallout 4 and executive producer at Bethesda Game Studios, which developed the franchise. We had a lot of conversations we had a lot of conversations over the style of humor, the level of violence, the style of violence says Howard, who's also an executive producer on the show. Look, Fallout can be very dramatic and dark and a post-apocalyptic you need to weave in a little bit of a wink. I think they threaded that needle really well on the TV show. Vault Boy not only appears on the show, but the imagine, but the imagery gets an origin story, which we won't spoil here. That was something that they came up with. So they're adding an origin story about the Vault Boy, which is not in the games. Fans of the game should know that everything in the series is officially part of, Beth- of Fallout lore, and Bethesda was careful to make sure the scripts could coexist with previous storylines from gaming titles. We view what's happening on the show in the show as canon. That's what's great. When someone else looks at your work and then translate it in some fashion, he admits to being envious of some of the show's interpretations and additions. I sort of looked at it like, ah, oh, why didn't we do that? Here's a picture of the giant uh, Brotherhood of Steel. That's the Brotherhood of Steel like ship. It looks pretty similar to the game. And all the vertebrates who look just like they do in the game. The prospect of a follow-up film or TV show has been in the ether for years, but Howard has always resisted to it. I've taken countless meetings with producers, I've heard pitches, and nothing ever felt right the right fit. He says, or maybe I was wondering a little, how will it affect the franchise? I took a very cautious approach. Howard is an admirer of Interstellar, which he cites as one of the inspirations for Bethesda's latest game, Starfield, a massive open world story that allows players to build their own characters and starships to explore more than a thousand planets scattered throughout the Milky Way. Movies he's worked on are some of my favorites, and I heard that he liked video games and had an eye for that stuff. I said to somebody, and I won't say who, but I was taking a meeting with another producer, and I said, before I talk to other people, I want to hear that Jonathan... Before I talk to other people, I want to hear that Jonathan Nolan says we'll never do it. He was his first choice, I guess. That led to a conversation between the two, and Nolan was actually interested. He and Joy acquired the rights to the Kilter production... For the Kil- Kilter Films production company, then... S- Set the about inventing new characters and trials and tribulations with executive producers and writers. Geneva Robertson Dorrit, co writer of Captain Marvel. Graham Wagner, a veteran of The Office, Portlandia, and Silicon Valley. That's interesting. Three funny shows. He's kind of like the, the comedy guy. So, two of them, there's two showrunners. That's unusual. There's not normally two showrunners. Howard says he and Bethesda were sold when Nolan and his team proposed building an entirely new story within the existing Fallout realm. I did not want to do an imitation of an existing story. That was the other thing. A lot of pitches were, you know, this is the movie of Fallout 3. I was like, yeah, we told that story. I do have, I don't have a lot of interest seeing those things translated. I was interested in someone telling a unique Fallout story. Treat it like a game. It gives the creators of the series their own playground to play in. That's a really sweet picture of the full on armor and how it looks in the show. Very detailed, looks exactly like it does in Fallout 3. As the Fallout show progresses, Lucy's journey and its intersects with two other this is a long article. Lucy's journey intersects with the two other lead characters who are new to the universe. One of them is the wannabe soldier Maximus. Aaron Morton, the tragic PD from the night of, who grew up above ground, but like Lucy, was also raised in a cloistered family of sorts. A brutal collective of warriors called a Brotherhood of Steel. It's a little bit of the Marine Corps, it's a little bit of the Knights Templar. It's kind of weird fusion, no one says. In the absence of a federal government, you just had all this military hardware lying around. Who would get it and how would they maintain control of it? The answer is the Brotherhood, which no one describes as being fueled by a mutated version of patriotism, religion, loyalty, and fraternity. Their control comes from the battalions of super soldier knights in shining power armor who stalk the landscape, enforcing the Brotherhood's notion of order. Maximus fills a role that straight out that straight out of mili- Maximus fills a role that straight out of medieval times. He's a squire, Nolan says. This is a drawing on the classic Arthurian knight legends where life was cheap and you had to squ- and you had to squire as long as they were useful. They had to prove their worth. They had to prove their valor and strength, and if they didn't. They were kind of cast aside. Another picture of Ella Purnell looking over a new city that she's probably just entering right now. Max serves the giant, seemingly robotic figure of his master in the same naive faith that Lucy has in her vault. 
but unlike her, he has a cynical sense of self-preservation that leads him to not always behave honorably or heroically. One of the things we're trying to, to gently size up here is that kind of binary thinking like, they're the good guy or the bad guy, Nolan says. Whoever the good and bad guys are, they destroy the whole world. So now we're in a much more gray area. Fallout's world is filled by a sprawling ensemble including Kamala Hallahan as Lucy's father, also the overseer of Vault 33, which essentially makes him the mayor of their hometown. While Homeland's Sarita Chodroy is a different kind of leader in this world, willing to sacrifice anything for a man of people. Moises Arias, or Moises Arias, who as a child played Rico on Hannah Montana. Co-stars as Lucy's inquisitive brother, Michael Emerson, who starred in Nolan's Person of Interest, is best known for his Hatch Inhabitant, and is best known as Hatch Inhabitant Benjamin Linus in Lost. Stays above ground this time, playing an enigmatic researcher named Wilsey. Most of the disparate parties are chasing an artifact that has the potential to radically change the power dynamic in this world. Then there's Fallout's wild card, its lead third figure. Mr. Walton Goggins, aka Ghoul, a sinister bounty hunter known as the Ghoul, played by Django and Chain and Hayfleet's Walton Goggins. Interesting that they only picked two Tarantino movies to talk about what he's been in, even though he's been in tons of stuff. The Ghoul is a gruesomely scarred Rough Rider who has a code of honor, but also a ruthless streak. He is the good, the bad, and the ugly all rolled into one. That's a good description. He also He's also quite a survivor, having existed for hundreds of years. The show occasionally flashes back to the human being he once was. A father and husband named Cooper Howard, before the nuclear holocaust turned the world into a cinder and transformed into an undead, noseless, sharp-shooting fiend. In the Fallout games, ghouls are typically cannon fodder, mindless zombies whose bodies have been mutated by radiation. The ghoul is a legend, distinct among its kind for his cleverness and cunning. There is... Still something of Cooper Howard, the person he used to be within this dissected form, or desiccated form. Walton's equally adept at drama and comedy, which is so difficult, Nolan says. There is a chasm of time and distance between the between who this guy was, and there's a chasm in time and distance between who this guy was and who he's become, which for me creates an enormous dramatic question. What happened to this guy? So we'll walk backwards into that. He compares the ghoul to the poet Virgil in Dante's Inferno, someone in this hellish landscape who knows its full scope, origin, and secrets. He becomes our guide and our protagonist in that world, even as we understand him to be the antagonist at the end of the world. The games have already created a template for how creatures like him look, but that was dialed back for Goggin's character. For one, he's smarter than the average ghoul. He would naturally have a different physique and face, but there's also a practical reason to make him less ghoulish. You'd be extremely careful with it when you're putting a full appliance on someone's face because you hire the actor for a reason. You want the tiny little expressions and changes that they make. Here's another picture of what we saw before, but a lot more clear. And now we see that behind him, that's I thought that was another person, but it looks like a statue or a mannequin of some sort. Prosthetics designer Vincent Van Dyke, who worked on Leonardo Capner's character in Kills the Flower Moon, devised the look of the ghoul. I need to be able to see Walton and his performance. He needs to look like a ghoul from the game, and he needs to be kind of hot. <laughs> that last part turned out to be literally cool. The first day we were shooting with Walton in makeup, he comes to set and I'm looking at him like, Walton, are you crying? He just had sweat leaking out of the prosthetics under his eyes because he was so hot. If Lucy is the innocent of the show, then the ghoul is her polar opposite, damaged and hardened by centuries of endless life in state of near death. He's got a lot of mileage on him, but he's still got a swagger and a kind of charm to him. Nolan says, like its anti-heroes, the world of Fallout has to maintain an ideal and appeal despite its grim aspects. It's a dark world in many ways, Nolan said, but the games were fun to play, fun to explore, and I think that was a mandate for us to make sure that it was enjoyable to spend time in this universe. Well, that's the end of the article, and it ends with another actual behind-the-scenes picture of Mr. Jonathan Jonah Nolan and Ella Purnell holding a gun that kind of looks like a gun from the game, but looks a little different, too. 
but I want to get into the photos in a separate video. Well, there you have it, my friends. A nice, huge info dump about the Fallout game series, which comes out in April. No, that's like, we still got a while, like another six months maybe, so. But yeah, this is definitely at the top of my list of most anticipated new, not not, not just new shows, but new video game adaptations. Because I have a good feeling about this, just like I did with Last of Us. I knew that it was going to be good on some level, and it was amazing. And now Fallout could potentially do that as well. Maybe not be amazing, but I have a feeling it's going to be really good. That would be my pre-rating. But yeah, guys, I would love to know what you think of any of that information, if that excites you at all. The story itself, it kind of just seems like another Fallout game series story. Similar, but instead they just changed the names and the locations. That's kind of what it sounds like. Not that I care. I guess I'm going to see it anyways. But that's it for me, guys. Don't forget to like and subscribe and comment below and let me know what you think. And as always, don't forget to keep gaming.